you'll also see it at least for uh, some of the research that we need to collaborate and learn from other diseases. And we can do that uh, by studying some of our parallel diseases and partnering uh, with our colleagues. Uh, I think it's really important if I'm going to be talking about different drug companies and different drug development that I uh, disclose a few things. One is that I do get some grant support from Roche and from Cerevel, two companies that have drugs in development. Um, I have no personal financial gain from any of the outcome of the research that I'm going to be discussing today. I don't do consulting and <clears throat> to these companies to the point uh, where I'm going to have any out. My, my personal uh, gain is, is not tied to anything I'm going to be talking about today. The other disclosure, um, I was letting my children know about the talk I'm giving today. Um, and my oldest daughter is 21 and thinking about doing a uh, master's degree in communication and science. And she wondered why I chose the colors. So I just wanted to let you know uh, that yellow on blue provides the best contrast and people with Parkinson's disease often have contrast issues. So this should be uh, clear in terms of the visual, and I hope it's clear in terms of what I'm presenting. Now, um, I am uh, going to talk about the development of trials, the process itself, because I think it's really important to understand that in context of what is going on. Um, I am not going to be able to talk about all the different trials that are out there. There are just so many, as you will see, but I do want to give you the tools how to find trials, if that's something that you're interested in. Of course, I want to talk about some of the studies that are going on at BI, and then some of the other studies with some of our, our partner um, areas. I, I'm really not going to be talking about the results of recent clinical trials. I am going to give you a, a brief tool how to find that. I'm happy to address some questions if you have them about specific outcomes of trials in terms of what's been presented recently. But in 45 minutes, it's impossible to cover everything related to research. Uh, now, in terms of um, the process of developing a drug, this is what we typically think about in terms of therapeutic and disease modifying drugs. There's a whole other pathway and we certainly are involved in biomarker discovery, in development of other technologies to better diagnose and track Parkinson's disease. Epidemiologic research, I'm also involved in the Framium heart study, so looking at risk factors, why people develop Parkinson's disease in the first place. There's a tremendous amount of research that goes on outside of therapeutic drug development, but I really want to focus, at least for the first part, on therapeutic drug development. So to make sure that we're all on the same page, when we're talking about phases, we're really talking about FDA regulatory development. There's a tremendous amount of work that goes in preclinically. There are tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of chemical compounds that are screened uh, and tested in the lab for safety and for efficacy in different models before a single uh, molecule is put into a human. I, I don't wanna diminish that work, but that's not the work that I'm gonna be talking about. Unfortunately, sometimes that's what makes the news. We are able to cure Parkinson's disease in a mouse. So those, that's the kind of headline that you wanna be cautious of, uh, but there is so much work that goes on there. Um, I'm not really gonna be talking about that. When we talk about phase one, uh, in terms of the development, that's the first in human. So the first time it goes into humans, we really need to make sure that it's safe and that our estimates of dosing based on animal studies is correct. This is a very small number of people. It's usually in the tens, uh, and it's really to find what is the, the dose that is best to move forward with. In phase two, this is where there's the first introduction of a placebo, and often people ask, why do we need a placebo? And uh, couldn't we just develop drugs without placebos? And we really cannot do that. Uh, we need to figure out, does it work and is it safe? And, and really the best way to do that is to compare it to a placebo. Um, let me give you an example. Constipation is very common in people with Parkinson's disease. But if there's a drug that we test and 60% of people complain of constipation during the, con the, the conduct of the study, 
Is that the drug or is that the underlying disease? And I think that a placebo can help us sort that out. So in phase two, there's a placebo. We're still looking at safety. We're starting to get a hint of efficacy. We're starting to find the right dose. And instead of four doses that are tested in phase one, perhaps there's two doses that are tested in a phase two. Um, and these are typically in the hundreds of people. Phase three uh, is what is the last step before it goes to the FDA. And not everything that gets to phase three gets to the FDA, not everything that is successful in phase three, uh, but it does increase the probability based on um, how far along it goes. Phase three, the primary purpose is to look at efficacy and of course, continued safety. And this is usually hundreds or thousands of people that are exposed to the drug. Um, a lot of people don't recognize that there's phase four as well, post-marketing. There are very specific criteria for people to get into trials for the first three phases so that we can have a set group of people measure the intervention and see what happens when we give people the drug and others a placebo. But in phase four, there are no restrictions. What happens when people are on drugs that were not allowed in the first part? What happens when people have other medical issues that were not uh, permitted in the study because they might have been uh, too sick or thrown off the results for otherwise. So there's a tremendous amount of work that happens after a drug gets on the market as well. And that's really for safety purposes, what happens when the drug is in the real world. Um, and so this red arrow is <clears throat> really where you see the Wall Street Journal and headlines in the news uh, when, when drugs uh, come out before they get to the FDA. This is a complex slide, and I do not expect you to read this slide, but I want you to understand that there, when uh, I have a patient in clinic and they say, so what's going on with research in Parkinson's disease? This about sums it up. So it is a, a, an insane, crazy amount of research, which is really exciting. This is so much more than when I first started seeing Parkinson's disease patients in 2002. And I, I just to give you an idea, this is divided up in half. The top half are disease-modifying therapies. The bottom half are symptomatic therapies. And there are plenty of drugs that are in development and being tested uh, in, in many ways. This is not everything, by the way, either. So this is just the majority of, of what's out there and what can be picked up. Um, and you can see the center part is, is phase three. That's what we're most focused on. Uh, phase two is the middle ring, and phase one is the outer ring. This is published in a nice summary every year, and this is from the Journal of Parkinson's from 2021. And I wanna go through a few other um, uh, of the diagrams from this paper, just to give you an idea and to give you a sense of what's going on in terms of research. Uh, so this is a pie graph of what's happening in terms of phase one studies. And you can see at the bottom, just over a quarter are related to dopamine symptomatic relief. Um, the rest are really uh, disease modifying, which is not unexpected for early stage. Um, you can see that there's a small piece of the pie up at the top for non dopaminergic symptomatic relief up there, um, but about two thirds is really disease modifying. And you can see that this is about a, a, uh, just over a third, 34 and a half percent of all the clinical trials that, that were reported. So it's, it's, it's a wide range, uh, 46 agents in 49 trials in phase one. Now, th there's some exciting work. There's a, a wide variety of approaches here. What's the chance of success? And when you look at the likelihood of approval, once a drug even gets to phase one of the tens of thousands of compounds that make it into humans, um, if you look across all indications and then specifically neurology, it's about 6% of drugs that make it to phase one ultimately make it approved. So just because it's in phase one doesn't mean it's gonna be approved. Uh, for a variety of reasons. This is what's going on in terms of phase two. And you can see that the non-dopaminergic symptomatic relief and the dopaminergic uh, symptomatic relief is now 46.2%. So it's just under half of the trials. So it's a bit more, um, but there are still a number of trials that are being, excuse me, a number of compounds that are being tested for a variety of reasons um, in, in terms of uh, disease modification, and a variety of approaches. <clears throat> and again, this is 59 agents, and it's uh, almost, uh, it's 45.8% of all clinical trials are in phase two. When you get to phase three, 
that uh, symptomatic relief portion becomes even larger. And um, you can see that if it's, we're just talking symptomatic relief, that's the 68% plus the 25%. Uh, so it becomes a much larger percentage of the clinical trials. And this is for a variety of reasons. We're still working on better ways of measuring Parkinson's disease. What can we do to go beyond just symptomatic relief in terms of measuring it? We're working on that. There are lots of uh, possibilities, whether it is alpha-synuclein in the skin, um, alpha-synuclein in, in various uh, biopsies or body fluids, um, other proteins that we're looking at. So I think that there's still a lot of work to be done on the biomarker side, measuring Parkinson's disease um, on the inside. But it is clear that we can measure Parkinson's from a symptomatic perspective, which is why that regulatory pathway and measuring and seeing what's going on with Parkinson's disease is a bit easier. And uh, there's a higher likelihood of success as those compounds um, get through the, the pathway. Uh, so in summary, from the past few slides, there's 124 agents under investigation. So when people ask me what's going on, it's, it's overwhelming. It's great. It's really exciting, actually, to see how many different compounds are under investigation for both the potentially disease modifying and for symptomatic therapy. Um, and as I've said, there's a high proportion of symptomatic therapies as the agent progresses from phase one to phase three. Now, I, I know that that 6%, if it makes it to one uh, to phase one is, is discouraging, but it's really to make sure that it's safe and it works. Those numbers get much higher once drugs get to later stages. So in neurology, this is not just in Parkinson's disease, but across all neurological um, indications, the probability of success at phase two is 26.8%, and probability of phase three success is just over uh, 50%. So it, it does go up as it goes along, which is understandable. Um, <clears throat> and so there are still plenty of drugs that are in development and well along in the, uh, uh, the, the pathway. I want to talk a few minutes about finding trials and then go into more details about uh, trials themselves that, that are going on. How do you find trials? It's really, the, there's 124 compounds is, how do you find those and, and hear news about what's going on? So of course, talk to your provider. Uh, you're, many of us are involved in many of these trials and know what's going on. Uh, we do have a newsletter, so please sign up for that. We always highlight some research. There are multiple foundations that have nice summaries of clinical trials and have email lists for you to, to find them. Um, Parkinson Study Group is a, uh, a, a nonprofit organization consortium of academic centers that do research with Parkinson's disease. And of course, BI is a site for them. And um, so keep an eye. And then larger bodies to take a look at is CenterWatch. And people often will turn to clinicaltrials.gov. I want to show you a little bit about clinicaltrials.gov and then go into our trials. Okay, so what happens if you go to clinicaltrials.gov and put in Parkinson's disease, you get over 3,000 clinical trials. It's overwhelming. It's drinking from the fire hose, and that's not, it's not feasible. So you want to know what's active, what's going on now, and so what's coming up. So if you, ex if you only look for trials that are not yet recruiting, it means they're getting ready to, that are recruiting, enrolling by invitation, or active but not recruiting, meaning that the study is ongoing, that narrows it down a little bit, 842. And then if you look for drugs that are in human development that are interventions, so they are not biomarker discovery, which is important, I don't mean to diminish that, but if you're looking for therapeutic interventions, you wanna look for phase one to three, that narrows it down further. What's going on in US sites, Massachusetts, and recruiting, and you get five trials. Uh, that's much more manageable than over 3,000. And what does that look like in terms of uh, the trials <clears throat> that are either recruiting or active, not yet recruiting? And this is the list. I've done your homework for you. Um, and so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about these trials, and specifically because these are the trials that are going on at BI. And so um, I, I want to tell you a little bit more about these uh, the, the one I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on is that bottom one, a study to evaluate the efficacy of presonezumab, uh, which is the Roche compound. It's an alpha, it's a monoclonal antibody against alpha synuclein, so a human-made immune cell that blocks the main protein that we can measure in Parkinson's disease. 
Um, so uh, that's an ongoing study. We are still giving this drug every month and monitoring people over time. It's got some promising early results and there are more studies going on with that. Um, so what's going on at BIDMC? So to give you an idea in terms of, uh, this is a really nice sample. It was one of the reasons that I think we choose the trials that we do. We have a couple of trials for people that are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and are early in the course of their disease, early enough that they don't need any treatment. <clears throat> and so I'm gonna tell you more about each of these trials, but this is just to give you an, an overview in terms of the types of trials that, that we have going on at BI. And then we have a, a couple of trials for people that are treated with Parkinson's disease, may have had the disease for a few years and, and are starting to experience some of the complications of therapy that we know can happen in many patients with Parkinson's disease. And um, we have a, a trial for those with sleep difficulty. Now, my whole career started because I spent a year at the University of Chicago studying sleep and circadian rhythms. Um, so I have a, a, a bias toward um, uh, sleep uh, studies and, and understanding sleep better. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that study. And then we have a couple of trials that we are, are not running, but we certainly are recruiting for and feel it's important to do. On top of that, these are a couple of studies that anyone diagnosed with Parkinson's disease can participate in. And they're really interesting and exciting. And I'll tell you a little bit about more of those. And again, we have uh, the Pasadena study, which is an open label extension and we're not enrolling anymore, but it certainly is active and, and we continue to monitor people over time. Okay, uh, so the Neurally study, which is what we uh, fondly call it, um, it's a multi-center randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. So that's a mouthful to say, it's the gold standard of clinical trials to evaluate the efficacy and safety and tolerability of this drug over 36 weeks of treatment in early stage Parkinson's. Um, so the PI is David Simon. And uh, if you're interested, there's uh, Anya's information. Um, the main goal is uh, to test if neurally, NLY01, neurally, it, which is an exenotide analog, will slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. Now, what is exenotide? That's always the question. And actually for decades, there's been an interesting association that people with uh, type two diabetes are increased risk for Parkinson's disease. It's not clear why. And that the rate of Parkinson's disease is lower in those groups of patients who are placed on certain drugs related to exenotide. And so we said, maybe we should take that association and test it specifically in Parkinson's disease. And so that's exactly what we're doing here. And so this is over a year because really, if you're looking at disease modification, you have to follow people for about a year when it comes to Parkinson's disease. And this is a drug that is given weekly as a subcutaneous injection. So it's a very small needle that you put just under the skin. Um, <clears throat> it's in a, a wide range of, of, of people uh, with Parkinson's disease aged 30 to 80, but you can't be on any Parkinson's disease medications and you're not likely to require treatment during the duration of the study. So that's one of our studies uh, for uh, early Parkinson's disease early enough without needing treatment. If there are people that are early, but are a little on the later side and perhaps are looking for symptomatic therapy rather than I don't need symptomatic therapy for a year, um, then you can think about uh, getting more information about the TEMPO-1 study. So this is a phase three. So remember, um, it's already gone through phase one and phase two. So this is one of the last uh, studies that's being done before the company turns to the FDA and applies for approval. And this is over 27 weeks, so uh, just over six months, to evaluate the safety, uh, efficacy, safety, and tolerability of two fixed doses of Tavatapan in early Parkinson's disease. So the sponsor for this is Cerebell Therapeutics. I'm the one who's um, leading the, the study locally. And so Tavatapan is a partial agonist of the dopamine-1-like receptors. So what does that mean? Partial agonists or dopamine agonists are standard medications that we use. So those are medications like Pramipexol, Rotigotone, uh, and um, uh, Requip, uh, Ropinerol. Um, uh, apomorphine is also a dopamine agonist. Um, but these medications are, are very good 
and they're very good for many people, but they're not perfect. And so we're looking for medications that can treat the symptoms and perhaps may do a better job or have lower side effects. And that's exactly what we're looking for in this study. <clears throat> so this is patients who have Parkinson's disease who are not looking to stay off for, um, for a year, that's neurally for disease modification. This is symptomatic therapy. And so even though we want the, that, that golden trial to um, find a cure for Parkinson's disease, we need to treat the symptoms for people living with it today. And so this is for people who require pharmacologic interventions for their disease management. We're looking for people aged 40 to 80 within three years of their diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, relatively early in terms of the stage, on and yarns based on the physical symptoms, uh, basically no balance issues. And um, treatment naive to dopaminergic agents. So in other words, they can't have uh, medications um, on board. And so this is over um, 35 weeks total, uh, but about six months of, of treatment. Okay, so those are for the early, not yet treated Parkinson's disease. I wanna move into a couple of trials that are going on for uh, people that have the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease are on treatment and are starting to experience some of the fluctuations. So the boundless study. Um, and so this is really an, uh, a, a subcutaneous infusion. So just under the skin, uh, uh, infusion of uh, levodopa compared to people taking oral uh, carbidopa levodopa. And uh, so this is Neuroderm is the sponsor for this. Dr. Lan Luo is one of our movement disorder uh, experts who is uh, directing this. And uh, this is for people who have um, Parkinson's disease who are experiencing motor fluctuations and may even be considering deep brain stimulation. Now, just a word about Parkinson's disease and the gut. Um, we know that the gut is involved in Parkinson's disease and that drug delivery is not perfect when it comes to our oral medications. Um, there are a few medications that bypass the GI system. There's in the inhaled version of levodopa called Embresia. There's a patch that you can put on that's a dopamine agonist. That's a rotigotine patch. Uh, goes by the brand name of Nupro. There's an injectable. There's uh, a medication that gets a, a few medications that get absorbed underneath the tongue. Um, and so there are lots of options that bypass the, the GI system. However, with levodopa, there's just the inhaled version, which is not for everybody. Um, and so we're looking at different ways of delivering levodopa into the system while bypassing the GI system. And that's what this study is. People who are on levodopa uh, and who have some fluctuations. Um, and importantly, this is many, like many trials, uh, more of the visits can be done virtually. Um, they can be, we always like to see people in person and, and prefer to, to um, talk to people but uh, in, in person, but it can be done uh, virtually. So we understand that, that some people that have lots of motor issues and fluctuations uh, may have challenges getting into Boston. And so this may be a, a study to consider for you. This is another study for people, again, on, uh, on symptomatic therapy that are starting to have some fluctuations. Um, and so this may look familiar because I talked a couple minutes ago about tempo one, this is tempo three. And so this is tevatapan, the same dopamine agonist that we we're talking about in early Parkinson's disease, but we're looking at it as adjunctive therapy in people who are already on levodopa, who are starting to have some fluctuations, who have some off time uh, without troublesome dyskinesias. And it's the same compound that I just talked about that's related um, in, in terms of the key study criteria, again, ages 40 to 80, about two and a half hours of off time uh, on a couple of days and a good response to levodopa. So again, this is uh, about six months of, uh, of exposure to the dopamine agonist. So I think that we have a wide variety of what's going on in terms of people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease um, in terms of therapeutic interventions. Uh, I, I want to talk uh, about a couple other um, studies. This is through Neuronext. Neuronext is uh, the Network for Excellence in Neuroscience Clinical Trials. Um, it's through the National Institutes of Health, and there are 25 sites slash centers across the U.S., um, and we are um, one of those sites. I am uh, actually the principal investigator 
of uh, Neuronext for Beth Israel. And this is a really interesting study that uh, gets at a lot of my roots. It's a dose selection trial of light therapy for impaired sleep in Parkinson's. And we know that at least three quarters of people with Parkinson's have sleep related issues. And uh, so this is one way of addressing that that's non-pharmacologic. There are clearly some aspects of Parkinson's disease, sleep disruption that pharmacology is important to address, whether it's REM sleep behavior disorder or insomnia in different ways. Um, but <clears throat> this is to look at once or twice daily bright, uh, bright white light therapy uh, to see if that can help improve sleep in patients with Parkinson's disease. Um, so you have to have mild, moderate, or severe difficulty going to sleep, or what's more common in Parkinson's disease, staying asleep throughout the night. And there are um, some specific questionnaires that we go through to help uh, use this. Now, importantly, uh, people really can't be on uh, sedative drugs for this. And this is a 16-week study. Very interesting um, and, uh, and not a pharmacologic intervention. What happens when we partner? And this is really important. When you put Beth Israel with Parkinson's Study Group and the Parkinson's Foundation, you get clinical trials. And you get some important and interesting clinical trials. And I want to talk about two in particular. So the TOPANS trial is a trial of Parkinson's disease and zoledronic acid. So zoledronic acid is an FDA-approved drug that's used for osteoporosis. Carly Tanner is the um, co-PI, and this is NIH with Parkinson's Foundation and Parkinson's Study Group. This is a home-based study, home-based study. You don't have to go anywhere. It is a remote trial, and it's determined if a single dose of this osteoporosis drug can prevent fractures and reduce uh, death rates in people over 60 with Parkinson's disease. Um, and so this is um, not, does not take a lot of time. Uh, and uh, there's a nurse that can come to your home and we can do all the assessments remotely. So a lot of people like that, particularly in the, this current era. Um, this is uh, PD generation and mapping the future of Parkinson's disease. And this is the Parkinson's Foundation in partnership with the Parkinson's study group. And of course, uh, we are also recruiting for this. Um, as you may be aware, there are some genetic forms of Parkinson's disease, but that is a minority of cases. It's about 10% of cases. Uh, and, but we are still looking for different ways of finding those um, patients with Parkinson's disease who might have genetic forms um, and other uh, finding out new ways, new genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. We're always looking for that because we don't fully understand still why most people get Parkinson's disease. And so this is where some of my work with Huntington's disease overlaps with my work with Parkinson's because we are doing some genetic counseling and, and looking for different genes uh, for Parkinson's disease. And so this is also a fully remote study. You get a, a kit sent to you at home and you can do a, a cheek swab and send that in. And the genetic counseling can happen remotely uh, as well. Really interesting and helps us to understand Parkinson's disease better from a genetic perspective uh, and is um, also a way to potentially set up uh, a repository and database of people uh, with, with um, different forms, potentially of genetic forms of Parkinson's disease to help us develop new clinical trials for the future. So it, it's, it's a really important observational study. Okay, I, uh, if you go to the Parkinson's uh, study group website, uh, this is the landing page, and this is what you're gonna see. I'm gonna go through some of the trials that are there. Um, I shouldn't say trials, the studies that are listed there because it's really important for us to be able to understand Parkinson's disease better. And that's most of what's there right now. And I, they may not be recruiting, but I think it's important to know what's going on and percolating through the, the study. Um, I, I mentioned this one, this, this is not everything, by the way, that's on the website or that's going on with Parkinson's study group, but, but this is some of the highlights that I thought given the time that I had. And, and so study of Parkinson's disease and exercise, there are many, many, um, exercise programs that are going on, including through our own Wellness Works. Um, and, but this is a, a multi-site clinical research trial that's focused out of Northwestern, looking at higher intensity um, exercise in people with, with Parkinson's disease. And again, this is for people not yet on medications. Um, this I thought was interesting, <clears throat> your STEM PD, uh, because we're, there, every few years there's another device 
that seems to stimulate the sensory system that with the hopes that it will help with the motor system as well. And so this is a little device that goes on the ear that's on the same side as the body that's more impacted by Parkinson's disease. There have been other devices that have provide vibration on the foot, um, weights in different places, sensation in different places, um, uh, devices over the hands to help with tremors. These are the kinds of devices that are sometimes tested uh, in Parkinson's disease. And, and this is uh, another device uh, that's being uh, looked at. Uh, this I think is very timely. This started long before the pandemic. And um, for those of you that are watching this in the Northeast, we often have snowstorms uh, on the East Coast in the, uh, in the Atlantic. There are hurricanes, there are power outages, there are dust storms, uh, you name it. There are different ways why people are not able to make it in to study visits. Um, and so there's, a, there's been a great effort for some time to look at how can we assess Parkinson's disease remotely. And this is a, uh, a publication <clears throat> of the at-home PD study looking at telehealth outcomes um, and, and digital biomarkers of Parkinson's disease uh, progression. So specifically, there were a couple of um, studies that this was incorporated in, and there are other participants that are being recruited to help with um, looking at measuring Parkinson's disease remotely. So as you can see, uh, there are a number of um, uh, tasks. So people are followed annually, uh, they have tasks to do at home using a smartphone. <coughs> and there are patient recorded uh, reported outcomes as well. Um, I think it's also important to, uh, to mention that Parkinson's disease, as far as we know, is uh, a, a vast majority um, of uh, Caucasian um, and is two thirds male. But there is a, a real effort to foster inclusivity in research, um, particularly for underrepresented populations in Parkinson's disease. Um, this, the, the sponsor is Michael J. Fox Foundation is distributed through Mass General. Um, I will also say that um, uh, there, this, the, the effort is to get at community hospitals. Uh, and this is happening not just through this study, uh, but on a local level as well. So um, this is a, a, a hot topic and the Parkinson's study group is, is taking it on as well. Um, this is a registry for advancement of deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease, and this is an observational study. I think that it's important to participate in registries because it helps us to understand uh, what is happening um, in Parkinson's disease over time. It, we still need to understand this disease better. Okay, so um, I, I want to leave a, a few minutes for questions, and, and so I just want to finish up with a couple of slides um, one is uh, finding results. I didn't talk about results of clinical studies and there's always news. I have a Google alert where every day I find out what's going on with Parkinson's disease. And there are some days where it's, it, there's so much that's in my inbox, it's, it's hard to read it all. PubMed is the publicly available search uh, database to, that you can search to find published results. Um, so that's what I do. If you just put in Parkinson's disease, you get 126,000 results. It's really, again, there's, it's, it's an overwhelming and, and a lot. But if it filter with clinical trials, publications in the last year and, and limited to English, it's just a measly 141 studies. Um, so I think that just shows how much research is going on and the pace of research and what's happening in terms of development of drugs and our understanding of Parkinson's disease. It's really at an incredible clip. And um, I think that the only way to do this is with collaboration. Um, we can't do research without the people, the key stakeholders. That's you, patients and families um, giving their time uh, and, and participating in these studies, showing their interest. We, it would be impossible without people like you participating um, and spreading the word. Um, you're hearing from some of the neurologists today we are the clinicians, but there is a huge group of people that we have to support that are behind the scenes that make everything happen. They're, they have to work with the regulatory agencies and our uh, ethics boards and make sure the T's are crossed and I's are dotted for all of the studies. Um, and so we have a tremendous infrastructure that we have to support 
to make these trials work. And um, it's, I, I, I don't know if people appreciate the amount of time that goes in uh, to even the simplest of studies. And it is not the neurologist's time. We come up with the ideas, but we hire people and support our uh, staff that do so much to make this happen. We have our partners, our nonprofit partners, Michael J. Fox, Parkinson's Study Group, Parkinson's Foundation. They're really critical to supporting our work and getting word out there and, and being a network for us. And experts in companion diseases. And I put up here PAINT, the Program to Advance Innovative Neurodegenerative Therapies. I have partnered with Dan Press, who does, does a lot with um, cognitive issues in neurodegenerative diseases, but we realized that our approach to Alzheimer's, to Parkinson's, to Huntington's disease was very, very similar. And so we have staff that are trained in um, similar techniques that we can cross-pollinate and generate ideas. And there's a drug that's in development um, for uh, one disorder that, that actually we can use for all three. And it's, uh, as an example, it's um, that, well, I'll say the name of the company, it's Sage Therapeutics. We're looking at it in the context of Huntington's disease, but the same compound is being looked at in Parkinson's and in Alzheimer's. So once we're familiar and we know what this drug is about, what are the impacts? What are the side effects? Who would best be uh, a person to participate in the trials? We can, we're collaborating. And so collaboration both internally and externally is really important, and it all focuses around our patients and families. And um, so with that, I think we have a, about five minutes or so um, to take questions. So I'm gonna, um, I will stop there and uh, let me just see, how do we want to uh, do? So Sam, I don't know if you yes. can see or hear me, but thank you for a wonderful talk. I also love that image of the owl as an intro to the, to the question side. Um, we do have